Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, actually, depending on where you're tuning on in the world. Welcome to this special edition of the HR Leaders Podcast. Today, I'm joined by the founders and president of the 100 Coaches, a community of the world's top coaches and leadership experts and an agency that connects them with the world's top leaders. I'm really, really excited for this session. We're going to be talking about their new book, Becoming Coachable, Unleashing the Power of Executive Coaching to Transform Your Leadership and Life. I have the privilege of having all three co-authors today. I'm super lucky and yeah. excited to, to have that. First up, we've got Scott Osmond, who's a co-founder and CEO at 100 Coaches Agency. Jacqueline Lane is a president of the 100 Coaches Agency. And our good friend, Marshall Goldsmith, who's back again, um, if, um, number one executive coach in the world and two-time winner of the Fingers 50 Award yeah. uh, of a number one leadership thinker in the world and also co-founder of the 100 Coaches Agency. Nice to see all your smiling faces again. How is everyone? Wait, I must interrupt you before we even begin. I am no longer the number one executive coach in the world. Okay. Uh -huh. No, you see, the award is named after me. So it, would be, <laughs> yeah. it, it would be a little tacky for me to award myself. <laughs> oh, so you've changed. Do you know what, Marshall? I've known you so long, and I've said that so many times that it's ingrained. <laughs> and now the winner, the winner of the number one coach in the world is Marshall Goldsmith. Thank you, Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> That's the luxury of having it named by you, right? Isn't it? Isn't, yeah. that, one of the, isn't that one of the benefits? <laughs> it's the, the first member of the Hall of Fame. Yeah, 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 yeah that, that's where they put old people. So it's, oh. good. it's all good. <laughs> no worries, Marshall. It was nice to see you all again. It's nice to see smiling faces. I, I'm really excited to share the, this new book with our audience. I thought it would be a good place to start. You know, what was the inspiration behind writing the book? Uh, let's kind of start there. Uh, yeah, I'll take this one. So, um, well, gosh, you know, I'm, I met Marshall about eight years ago. Uh, I didn't know anything about executive coaching then. And, um, and over the course of working with him and developing the 100 Coaches community, <clears throat> I came to know a lot of coaches uh, and saw what they did and, and what they were doing. And I periodically would ask them, you know, if they would coach me and they'd say yes. And it never seemed to work out. Um, and then about a couple of years ago, working with Jacqueline, uh, it came to light that um, the problem wasn't the coaches, the problem was me. Uh, the problem was that I didn't know how to become coachable and be ready to be coached. Um, and I think that inspiration led to the journey that became the book. We realized there's no book out there. There's no knowledge out there about how to prepare yourself to be a great coachee. Um, and as Marshall says, and he'll back me up here, the most important part of coaching is the quality of the coachee, right? You're not going to, you're not going to have a great coaching outcome if you don't have great coaching inputs. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think the client I've talked about this that I coach, I spent the least amount of time with and proved the most. And um, I asked him, Alan Mulally, his name was probably the greatest corporate CEO in the world in the last 30 or 40 years. And I said, uh, what you learn about coaching from you? He said, it's all about work with great people. You know, you work with great, dedicated people. This coaching process can be incredibly helpful. You work with people who don't care. You're wasting your time. And, you know, there's a lot of HR leaders on the call. One advice I have for you is if they don't care, don't waste your time and don't waste your money. You know, really invest your time with people that care and especially high potential leaders. You know, if high potential leaders have an attitude problem, out, out, out. Don't waste your money. Put your money and time in with the ones that care. They're the ones that are going to get better anyway. And as an HR leader, you are doing something good for them in their career. If they don't want it, that's a very bad sign. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Jacqueline, talk about how, um, so when we had this inspiration, then we had, you know, 100 plus amazing coaches to talk to about what makes someone coachable. Yeah, so we were really trying to understand what makes some coaching engagements more successful than others. And it came down to a few things. It's that, that word coachability, right? People who are coachable have better results more quickly, plain and simple. So we really tried to break that down and understand it. We came up with what we call our openness framework. And our openness framework just says, are you open to four things? Open to change, open to feedback, open to taking action, and open to being held accountable. Mm -hmm. And if you are open to all four of those things, then congratulations, you're a coachable leader. Uh, but the great news about each of those things is they're all a spectrum. We can all be more open to change, more open to feedback, more open to yeah. taking action, and more open to accountability. And so we can all continue to grow as leaders, continue to become more coachable, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. and take advantage of the growth that's available to all yeah, of us. It was amazing, Chris. You know, we had this big community of people to talk to. 
hundreds of hundreds of years of experience mm-hmm. that we drew from uh, coaching probably almost every company in the world at this point. Um, and that's we distilled um, all of that knowledge down to those four key insights. Amazing. Uh, break it down in terms, you know, what does it mean to become coachable? You mentioned your own journey. <laughs> How yeah. do you describe that? Yeah. Well, I'm, um, gosh, it's the introduction to the book, isn't it? Um, well, the very, the very first insight for me, um, and again, Jacqueline was a big teacher f- for this, uh, was being open to change. Mm-hmm. Um, Marshall talks a lot about how one of the biggest problems that a leader has is they, they either think they have all the answers or think they should have all the answers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and therefore they're not listening for other people to have input. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, you know, <laughs> I'm guilty of that problem. Uh, I needed help. I've been hearing Marshall uh, excoriate leaders for years, uh, specifically around that, but couldn't see it for myself. Um, and it took someone like Jacqueline, who I work with, to bring it to my attention and allow me to be open to the possibility that I didn't have all the answers and therefore it needed to change. Yeah, I, I had some of my own experiences, especially as a collegiate athlete. Uh, when I, was, I joined uh, as a walk-on on the rowing team, and uh, learned very quickly that the ability to take feedback, the ability to take direction from someone who's outside of you is really the key to success. You know, mm-hmm. we can never see ourselves. We only ever see reflections of ourselves. And the same is true in our own lives and leadership. We really need to understand from the perspective of other people, especially the people we're leading, how mm-hmm. it is that we're behaving, how we're showing up. They can simply see things that we can't. Uh, and so being able to hear them and listen to them and take that mm-hmm. advice is, yeah. is really the key to growing long-term. The, the third key is taking action, which actually after uh, being open to change and feedback is pretty easy. Uh, you know, just the willingness to do the things that you're hearing you need to do. The hard mm-hmm. one though, and, and I know Marshall's going to want to talk about this, is accountability. Um, because people really don't, well, Marshall, I'll, I'll pass it over to you to talk about accountability. I love your newest thinking about how accountability never ends. Accountability is incredibly difficult. We all say we're in favor of more accountability. What we mean by that is I really would like it if you and these other people would start to become (laughs) accountable. I mean, you know, how about me? Well, not so much. Now, one thing I'm doing now in my own coaching, which is really fun, is I have something called a daily question process where people hold themselves accountable every day to certain questions and measure it. What I'm doing now for some of the greatest leaders in the world, get ready for this, I have someone calling on the phone every day, <laughs> mm-hmm. every day. Why? I have had someone call me on the phone every day for 25 years. Why? My name is Marshall. I'm too cowardly and undisciplined to do any of this stuff by myself. I need help. And it's okay. Hey, accountability is hard. Who are we kidding here? This is mm-hmm. hard work. Nobody gets better because they have a coach or they read a book. you got to work. Arnold Schwarzenegger, what do you say? Nobody got muscles by watching me lift the weights. You know, they got to lift the weights out here. And and as Scott said, it is hard to lift those weights. It's not hard to watch videos about weightlifting or read a book about it. It's just hard to do this stuff. My own clients are brilliant people. My clients are not a secret. Everybody knows who they are. <laughs> they got a new plan. Daily phone calls. Is it because they're stupid? Nope. Mm-mm. It's because they're busy. They're busy. They're under tons of pressure. It's hard to keep anything in your head, especially now with all this stuff going on. I just came back uh, last week from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Riyadh, I have to say, the leaders there didn't used to work that hard today. They work constantly. They work constantly. And they're good people. They enjoy. I work with a couple of ministers. They're really nice people. I want to get better. Their problem is they've got a thousand things going on at once and it's hard to keep anything in your head. That's why they appreciate having somebody call them up every day. Yeah. Who's calling them, Marshall? Just out of curiosity. Is it you? (laughs) 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 I have someone call me every day. day. I've got a person calling me, a, a nice person. Her name is Lisa. And, you know, it's not so much who the person is. It's just having someone remind you yeah. to do yeah. this. And, you know, I want to be sensitive to our audience, the HR leaders, and a couple of thoughts I had. One is, when is coaching a good investment? First, what we do is helping leaders achieve positive long-term change in behavior. 
So my whole mission is helping successful leaders get even better. Do a Google search, helping successful leaders. The first 500 hits, 450 are me. So I, that's me. Mm. On the other hand, there's a lot of people this doesn't work for. For example, I get a call from a pharmaceutical company. They said, we'd like you to coach Dr. X. I said, well, what's his problem? They said, he's not updated on recent medical technology. I said, neither am I. <laughs> I can't make a bad doctor a good doctor, a bad scientist a good scientist. And sometimes people use coaching as this catch-all solution to all problems. Uh, behavioral coaching solves behavioral problems. It doesn't turn bad scientists into good ones. Hmm. Next, behavioral coaching doesn't help if they have the wrong strategy. In my work, if somebody's got the wrong strategy, all I'm helping doing is get there faster. I'm not turning the wrong plan into the right plan. Next is don't coach people that don't care. Don't waste your time. Only work with dedicated people. And then also never coach an integrity problem. Mm. Right? You lie, you cheat, you steal. You should not get a coach. You should get fired. Yeah, you lie, you cheat, you steal, you get fired. You don't get a coach. It only takes one integrity violation to ruin the reputation of a company. Mm. So back to being coachable, I would put that as outside of the realm. If somebody's got an integrity problem, no. Don't waste your money. Yeah. You know, Chris, I'll add to that. Um, Marshall also talks about, you know, we talk about in the book about being coming coachable helps you be a better leader, but really also to be a better human being. Um, and I, it never gets lost on me. One of the, one of the most important accountability questions that Marshall asks, one of the, one of the key six is, did you try your best to be happy? Uh, and he'll tell stories about some of the greatest leaders in the world who forget to ask themselves that question. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I I love that by the way because you know Chester Chester Rotten, our good friend, is my coach. Sure. And as part of my daily questions, um, I have in there, you know, did I did I do my best to be a present dad? Mm -hmm. I did I do yeah. my best to let my wife know that I appreciate her, uh, you know. And um, I, when I first started thinking about coaching, I never thought about my personal life, mm -hmm. but I think it's I would say it's had more impact on my personal life than my business. Mm. Um, I had a choice recently where I had a very, very business, very, very important thing to do in the company, you know, big stakes, high stakes, but it was also my daughter's first day at school. And mm. uh, the first thing that came into my mind was Chester saying, Chris, no success makes up for failure at home. Right. Which is one of the things that we, we, we spoke about. And I was like, it doesn't matter how important this is. I forget about it. I'm going to be there for my daughter's first day at school. Um, everything else can wait. So when you when when I when I saw the title of the book or the subheading and I saw that the and life, that mm. really I, 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 that really meant a lot to me, um, <clears throat> as well. That's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, that by the way, that's something you're never going to regret. Mm -hmm. uh, several of people that I coach are billionaires, and like one guy's worth four billion dollars. I said, "What do you want me to coach you for? It bump you up from four billion to four point one billion." So, <laughs> <laughs> He said, look, Chris, back to your point. He said, I just want to be happier. You coach yeah. my friend and he's happier. Hey, that's all I want. Mm -hmm. I work, now, here's the irony. I work with him for a year. He gets much happier. I call him two years later last week. How's it going? You know what he said? It's, this goes back to Scott's point. Very deep. He said, I forgot to be happy. I forgot yeah. to be happy. Now, he's not a stupid person. Mm-hmm. He's worth $4 billion. <clears throat> He's a great business guy. I forgot to be happy. I need a call every day to remind me to be happy. Why? Well, yeah, yeah. Just did, you know, and what you did is you didn't forget your daughter. Mm -hmm. If you're not careful, though, you get so busy, you forget your daughter. Mm. It's not that you're a bad person, by the way. You just uh, running around. You can forget your family. You can forget to be happy. You can forget what matters in life. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, it's for that reason that um, I was speaking to Chester last week because uh, he wasn't feeling too well. I hope you're well, Chester. If you're listening, I hope you're feeling better. And uh, when I leave my house every day, I take two things: my phone and my gratitude stone. And if anyone yeah. who knows who Chester is, <laughs> he gives yeah. out these little stones with the word gratitude on, and I carry that everywhere. As mm -hmm. a reminder to that point, uh, Marshall, that no matter all the crazy things that are happening, just a reminder from a physical reminder in my pocket to be grateful <laughs> um, yes. as well. So something such, such a small thing, but has a huge impact. Um, Scott, what are some practical things people listening can do 
and take away from the book that they can use with their teams and, and, and the leaders in their organizations? Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, I'll just uh, pitch the book itself. The book itself uh, is a great opener to the conversation around coaching. Um, you know, the other thing we found is a lot of people don't know what coaching is, what to expect from it, who's coachable, as Marshall was talking about, who's not coachable. Um, so I think the, the first thing is the book gives some very good context and opens people up to, in a very soft way, uh, what coaching is all about and why you should be considering it. Okay. Um, and then the first, the first takeaway, again, it goes right to the openness framework, uh, which is just you've got to be open to change or you know, don't waste your time and money on coaching. Right. <clears throat> the other takeaway, a little aspirational, but I think the whole reason. Uh, so we, we had written the first two parts of the book. Um, we thought it was the book that we wanted to write, and then we read them and wasn't. Uh, part three was missing. And part three uh, really came from a conversation that we had about uh, to what end do we do all of this? Mm. Why, why coach? Uh, mm. And certainly we coach because we want people to be better leaders. Uh, and as we talked about just a moment ago, uh, not only better leaders, but better human beings. But the reason we want them to be better leaders and better human beings is because we're all in the interest of what we call human flourishing, which is making everybody's lives better, right? And we, and we I think, fundamentally believe that through um, improving leadership, we'll do that. Yeah, hmm. absolutely. And, you know, I think, Chris, to your point, you, we don't really flourish in life if we're only doing well in one part of our lives, right? If you're having lots of success in business and struggling personally, uh, I think it's hard for people to say that they're living a fulfilling, flourishing life. Uh, and I think one of the secrets about coaching is that, of course, yes, it makes a really big impact on a person's leadership and can help them have wild success in business, uh, but perhaps more meaningfully and, and even more importantly, it makes them better more human mm -hmm. at home. It makes them more successful in every other aspect of life as well. Uh, and again, mm. that's that idea of flourishing that, you know, by one of us showing up better in, in all of these different aspects of our lives, we have a ripple effect. You know, mm. we're interacting with so many different people that we lead in our families um, and in our communities. And if we can show up as flourishing ourselves and create that environment for other people, just think of the impact that we yeah. can really have. You know, Marshall, the, um, the idea of flourishing, I, I, the touchstone for me is that picture of you. Uh, I believe you were in the Peace Corps or in Africa uh, and you're looking at the camera and mm -hmm. the insights that you had about yourself and your perspective really to me were the core, were the essence really of human flourishing. And, and Chris, your point about like, what is the first takeaway? you know, recognize that everything you do as a leader is bigger than you. Mm -hmm. uh, Marshall, if you wouldn't mind just sharing that that story again from that picture. Actually, I use that picture. It was in the book Triggers as a reminder. And Chris goes back to you being grateful. I've had it in my house there. And it's I'm sitting there uh, kneeling down on the ground with some woman. She's measuring the arms of kids. And their arms are too big. They get no food. They're not hungry enough. Their arms are too little. They get no food. They're going to die anyway. Their arms in the middle, they get food. It's triage. And I had this picture of me in this line of kids, two thirds are going to die. And their parents are kind of watching this and this woman measuring the arms. And I'm looking in the mirror to send myself a message, be grateful. We're all so fortunate. Be grateful for everything you have here. And, but back to Chris's point, it's so easy to forget that. Mm. I mean, when I came home from that trip, I really was a changed human being for at least a week or two. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and then you know we lapse back into wackiness and you know one thing that's really my i think i've mistaught something over the years i did this study called leadership as a context sport anybody wants a copy of it send me an email marshall at marshallgoldsmith.com it's eighty six thousand people you can't argue with the research right and i said well look at this research back to stakeholder coaching if people do this they become more effective leaders that's what I used to teach. I don't, I don't think that's true anymore. I think they become more effective leaders as long as they're doing stuff. Mm -hmm. But you don't reach this nirvana-like state and you're a more effective leader forever. That would be like a tennis player saying, I don't need a coach anymore. Well, they all mm -hmm. have coaches, right? They're all trying to improve. So I don't see leadership development as an ending process or you, quote, get there. I don't really think there's a there. There's only one book that has the same ending, and they lived happily ever after. That is unfortunately called a fairy tale. 
you know, that's not the real world. And in the real yeah. world, we have to start over day after day after day. So back to coaching, uh, I don't see myself as ever, quote, getting there in some absolute sense. And, and you know, Chris, you mentioned your great examples. I'm sure you have what I call flashes of temporary sanity, where you actually <laughs> act <laughs> sane. <laughs> you, you know, you act sane and rational for a little bit. Yeah. Like, you know, we, we, if we're not careful, we just lapse back into the same old stuff. Yeah, yeah. more than I would care to, to admit. Yeah. But Chris, maybe sort of coming back to your question uh, and, and with Marshall's great answer, um, if, if coaching is a lifelong journey, um, then the inspiration is take the first step. Mm. Right. And it doesn't have to be a big step. It can be a small step, but you begin that journey of, you know, change and feedback and taking action and holding yourself and being held accountable. Um, then over the course of a lifetime, uh, you, your family and the people you love and lead, um, well, all their lives will be better. And that yeah. should be inspiration enough, even take a small step. Yeah, definitely. Um, something I was talking about again with Chester is about reps, starting with that first mm -hmm. rep. And as you know, we're talking about the gym analogy, the more reps you make, the stronger you get, the more consistent you get. But it's about right. taking those one, that first rep one right. step at a time um, along the way. And that applies to so many parts of your life um, uh, as well. Marshall, you, you've you've coached leaders all over the world. What do you see as the as the biggest barrier? Is it fear, you know, of you know, of, of that, that that's kind of stopping them? What 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 is it that stops people from becoming coachable? Well, the people that I coach, I have to say, I do not coach a normal subset of people by any stretch of the imagination. Mm -hmm. So I cannot really answer quote what a normal person is like because I don't work with normal people. Number one, the people I coach are way at the top of the food chain, either as a volunteer. I do tons of volunteer work. They're either leading a great place like St. Jude's Hospital or the Red Cross or the World Bank where I do volunteer work, or they're just phenomenally successful business people. So I'm not coaching a random sample of people. Two, I'm not dealing with unmotivated people. I have zero tolerance for people that don't care. They don't care. Just fine. Move on, move on, move on. I just don't waste my time. On the other hand, what is the biggest problem with people that I coach at my level who are motivated, who do want to get better, who are gung-ho and are brilliant? You know what it is? Just what we talked about. Their lives are barraged with stuff over and over. So I'm going to give you two answers. One is they are just busy. They've got a thousand things going on. And it is so hard. And by the way, everything I teach has to be positive, simple, focused, and fast. If I give the people that I coach complex stuff to do, they're not going to do it. They're not mm -hmm. going to do it. Why? How many time? Mm -hmm. It's got to be to the point here. Let's do stuff that's practical. So number one is that. It's got to be positive, simple, and focused fast because they're very busy too. There's an old saying, it's lonely at the top. It mm -hmm. used to be lonely at the top. It's lonely or at the top today. It is phenomenally lonely at the top. They don't have anyone to talk to. They can't sit there and, you know, randomly talk about whatever they feel like, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, those days are over and it is lonely. I, Mark Thompson, and I spent 600 hours with 60 amazing leaders over the COVID period talking about their lives. And they were just happy to have somebody talk to every weekend. It's lonely. And it's not, it's getting more lonely, not less. So the two variables, one, they have no one to talk to, but two, they're just phenomenally overwhelmed with stuff, mm -hmm. overwhelmed with stuff. So it's just really keep it going, keep it in focus, keep it going mm -hmm. back to Scott's concept of coachability. And that is really focusing on, I am the key driver here. See, the one mm -hmm. thing I've learned in my coaching, nobody gets better because of me. They yeah. get better because of them. Right. Yeah, they get better because of them. Yeah. yeah, Jacqueline, we're seeing that uh, even further, even even below the high reaches of where Marshall coaches, because we have coaches at many levels. Uh, why don't you talk about how we're seeing that all over? Because they're all busy. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's exactly it. It's everyone is is overworked and overwhelmed. And, you know, we feel this pressure to be always on. Uh, and a coach is someone who can help essentially just be there for you as a support system, a safe space. Uh, the one person, perhaps in many people's lives, that doesn't want anything from them other than their success, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, even even the people that work with and for you probably want you to do something or are, have a vested interest in some way that you behave. The coach's only concern mm -hmm. is really you and your success. You set the goals. 
and the coach is going to help you get there. Uh, so many of us, we just can't be conscious in every moment of every day. I mean, I can't remember what the statistic is now, but something like 90% of all the decisions we make and things we do happen unconsciously. So hiring a coach is one of the best things you can do to create a safeguard, some, a support system that's going to be there by default so that you, know, you have some guardrails that prevent you from going off too far one direction or another. Uh, and I think that's a really important mm -hmm. um, part of the coaching process. Yeah, that was something that was a big, one of my friends asked me, you know, what is the main benefit you have from having a coach? And it was none of the things I thought I would say. It's exactly what you said. Someone who's not my co-founder to talk to. <laughs> mm -hmm. Someone who's not my colleagues and, and <laughs> customers to talk to. Someone who's <laughs> going to hold me accountable <laughs> uh, as well. And all, all of the things to have that sort of safe space that you described to have conversations, be vulnerable, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, a, pl a place I can be vulnerable and not be worried about what people are going to think um and and then none of the they're none of the things that i thought it was going in <laughs> if i'm being honest uh mm -hmm. it, it was oh i Ch Ch chester's going to teach me all of these things and it wasn't that whatsoever um as well and and that's something that i think the hr leaders listening it can also be very very lonely to be a hr leader i always I'm make a joke i always make a joke with them who does hr go to hmm. when they got a problem yeah it, in an organization that's a common problem that i hear from them all the time it's very lonely to be a hr leader yeah. Chris, we have a, a, an amazing process at the 100 Coaches Agency of helping people find a coach. Uh, and it starts with a discovery call where we hear what they're looking for. And then we present our three solutions of the three coaches that we think would be right, sort of a curated set. And then we have a follow-up call with them to hear what they think. Um, what's amazing is uh, to watch a material change in their attitude and actually their yeah. physical appearance, knowing that there is someone out there that can be a non-judgmental, you know, non-stakeholder support mm -hmm. to help them be a better leader and better human being. Uh, and we watch this over and over again. I think it's the biggest surprise that we've had uh, in the work that we're doing is just watching that consistent and, and material change. Yeah, absolutely. And again, HR leaders are often the people that are helping other leaders find support systems those HR leaders need support systems too. Mm -hmm. I think we could all benefit from a coach. We could all benefit from a safe space, someone to turn to. Uh, as Marshall always says, it's, uh, my name's Jacqueline Lane and I need help. <laughs> we all do. We should make everyone right now listening on LinkedIn hold their hand up, Marshall. Yeah, no <laughs> kidding. <laughs> you know, a little I bit need help here. We all need help here. Yeah, it's a yeah. little bit of a cobbler's children problem for HR leaders. Uh, because you're right, they are always thinking about other people and how they can help them and putting them forward. Look, I'm sure they became an HR leader because they want to help other people. Right. Um, but, you know, put your mask on first. Sometimes the HR leader needs to have a coach to help them do their job well. Yeah. You know, you know, I have managed to make it this far without singing, but we have to stop that now. <laughs> in, the words, in the words of the immortal Rolling Stones, Cause we all need someone we can lean on. Um, listen, before I let you all go, firstly, thank you so much for joining. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, re I'm really, uh, I'm really grateful to, that you, you, you're with us today and the impact and the ripple effect that the work and the book's going to have on organizations, people, but also their home lives as well. Right. That, um, that we've just described. What's the one, what's the one thing that you want people to take away from the book? And then we'll say goodbye. Um, mm -hmm. Scott, you want to start? Um, yeah, um, sure. You know, I think the one thing, uh, it's going to be a two-part one thing, sorry. Uh, the, one <laughs> thing, the one thing I'd say is um, just remember that every, as a leader, everything you do is bigger than you, right? It's not about you. You've got to take your ego out of it and then just begin. Mm -hmm. That would be my, uh, my takeaway. Jacqueline? Yeah, I think it's, you know, the, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step get that first rep in. Uh, yeah, so true. And mine is start with yourself. Mm -hmm. Start with yourself because, I mean, as an HR leader, it's very easy to say they need to do this, they need to do that. My theory in life is if we don't apply it to ourselves, we have no idea what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. I mean, why do I know this is so difficult? Because I do it every day. It's hard. I know how hard it is because I do it myself. It's hard. To me, the best thing the HR leader can do is start with yourself. Do I want to do this stuff? Do I want to do this? Do I want to get better? 
The same thing I teach leaders, lead by example. Don't, don't just lead by talk. Then you have credibility when you ask other people to do things. You're not asking them to do something you're unwilling to do yourself. Yeah. You know, Chris, I, I didn't even think about it until right now, but I think the whole message of becoming coachable is coaching starts with you, right? And the, one of the first lines in the book is I was not always coachable uh, with the, you know, the full understanding that I needed to change to be able to have a positive coaching experience. And just like Marshall said, like start with you. Amazing. And, and for everyone listening, um, the, the, the book's on screen right now. So we're, I don't know where it is on the screen, but there's a screen uh, <laughs> over with, uh, with the book there. There's a link in the description to grab a copy. Uh, Scott, what's the, the best website for everyone also to go to? Um, yeah, the easiest, the easiest one, uh, you know, www.becomingcoachable.com uh, is the best website to go to. Uh, all of everything you need to know is going to be there. And um, the last part of the book is a conversation between the three of us. And our as aspiration is that, people will be able to join that conversation. We have some tools that we're going to be putting up so that people can have a conversation with us about becoming coachable. And one thing I would say as well is, um, Scott, and there's going to be many people also that are listening that are going to want to get coaching from you guys and be and and, and contact you through the agency. Where can they contact mm -hmm. you there if they, if they want to? Yeah, that would be agency.100coaches. That's 100coaches.com. Uh, or you can see the agency and the community at 100coaches.com. Amazing. Well, listen, thank you again for joining. Thank I you appreciate guys. you all. And uh, I wish you all the best until we next week. Bye, everyone. Thanks bye, so much. Bye. 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 bye.